Welcome everyone to the regular meeting of Board of Bowling Green Board of Commissioners for January 21st, 2020. I invite you to stand if you choose while Mr. Nash has the invocation and then followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would, please join me in praying to the God of your choice or none at all. Dear Lord, as we gather to make decisions for our community, may we use only our best skills and judgment, keeping ourselves impartial and neutral as we consider the merits and the pitfalls of each matter that is placed before us. May we always act in accordance with what is best for our community and our fellow citizens. Amen. If you would please take the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty Please call the roll. Commissioner Nash. Here. Commissioner Perigen. Here. Commissioner Beasley Brown. Here. Commissioner Denning. Here. Commissioner Wilkerson. Here. I'm sorry, uh, Mayor Wilkerson. Uh, I think we have some <laughs> awards and recognitions tonight. I would invite Operation Pride to come up. Howdy. How you doing? I'm still nervous every time I come up here. It's good. <laughs> We are too. We are. <laughs> all right, you all. So I'm William. Once again, I'm the graduate fellow with Operation Pod. Um, and what we're responsible for, of course, for the people who don't know, is beautification here in town and just building pride in our community. Um, that's Angie, my boss, of course. And we just want to say thank you all again for letting me come up here. Um, but I'll get started. All righty. So we have a residential today and a commercial, um, which is good. Um, and we'll start off with our residential. So at 731 Nutwood Street, um, the owner is Miss Shirley Roberts. And if you've heard her name before, it's because she owns Flowers by Shirley on Broadway. And she's been there for over 40 plus years. She's uh, raised her family in this home. Um, that's her son, Kelly, and then her daughter, Trey, Stacy. Cool. And then, so as you can see her home, brick home, um, still beautiful, you know, beforehand as well. Um, but then we go to the after. Oh, well, here's the back side, which she renovated as well. Um, you can see like a big rock and a tree and all this stuff. And then she renovated it. She painted it, got rid of some of the trees, made her home more visible on the corner. Um, and it's a very beautiful drive. If you drive past there and you see her home, it just really elevates the neighborhood. And we hope that it inspires other people in the neighborhood to do the same thing as well. Um, so, with that being said, I would love for Ms. Shirley Roberts to come up here and accept this World Award on behalf of Bowling Green and Operation Pride. And clap for her if we can. <laughs> you think you're nervous. <laughs> <laughs> She's a big time public speaker in town. <laughs> and do you have anything you'd like to say? So well, I, I'm, I'm just real pleased to get this. I think it's wonderful. And I hope, I do hope my neighbors will take, I really hope my neighbors will take, take this into consideration of doing a few things. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've lived there all my life. I love to live there. Uh, I thought it was time to do something because the old brown brick was really, really getting to me. <laughs> so um, thank you so much. No I, problem. I'm, I'm very flattered. No, we thank you. Thank you for what you do, okay? Uh -huh. I pass this house every day, maybe just two or three times a day. I, I'm have, sorry I didn't hear you. I said I passed that house two or three times a yeah, day. Yeah. And of course, you know you from your business there on, on Broadway. Hi. Uh, known for many years. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We appreciate this very much. Uh, this will go where it will be seen at my house. So this isn't it. We also have a yard sign that we'll put in front of your yard too so all your neighbors can get jealous. When Good. They drive Maybe by your the house. neighbors will take notice. <laughs> 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 well, I haven't finished with this. I'm still going to work with the yard. Mm -hmm. And um, when the sidewalk came in, I lost some of my big trees. So I'm going to call uh, and have them come out and make sure that we're planting them where they want to plant it <laughs> and replace them. I really want those trees back. So, I mean, they'll have to be smaller. I understand that. But my house is not the same with my trees gone. <laughs> well, but anyway, um, I will finish it this season. The weather kind of made me stop. But we're still going to do some, some small shrubbery instead of overgrown stuff and uh, that kind of thing, which makes everybody 
proud. Right. Yeah. Well, Shirley, you. I uh, think I think we have to talk to Miss or uh, HGTV about you. I think you're a star in the making. As she said, I she would was tune nervous. in to your show. <laughs> <laughs> she said you're a star in the making. Well, you know, when I get started talking, I guess I just don't. <laughs> 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 you fit in around here <laughs> pretty well. Let's take a picture of you. Thank you. All right, you all, and the next one is 3031 Nashville Road. And I'm sure a lot of you all are familiar, it used to be a gas station that's sat there since, I believe, the 1940s, I believe, and it moved from a gas station and then it became like an auto body repair shop. And then recently, it became a coffee shop, which is Q Emporium, if you all are familiar with it. Um, and I have the, the owners here, not the, they, they're the owners of the, the building, am I correct? All right, um, and they were Providence Homes. All right, so here it is afterwards. I wish I had more pictures of the inside, but I just hope that you all go by and visit in the first place. So this isn't just like a you look at it and then you celebrate it. This is a you look at it and you're curious to go on the inside and make business for them, okay? Um, but it's beautiful on the inside. They have wooden countertops so you can sit and work if you need to. You can study if you're a student like me. Um, but it's a very incredible place, and I wish I put up more pictures for you all. But as you can see, it looks incredible. Um, but I have Liz and... Steve <laughs> Nelson here, sorry I suck with names, um, and they're here to accept awards on behalf of Q Emporium. So a round of applause. <laughs> Alrighty. So like I said to Ms. Shirley back there, we appreciate you all for what you all done in the community. We appreciate the pride that you all have instilled in our community as well. I'm sure the neighborhood that's across from there, every single time they drive out of their neighborhood each day, they see what you all have done. And they're excited to have that in their community. They're excited to have that place to go to instead of having to come downtown and places like that. And I enjoy it. And I've been there like once or twice. And it's, it's a beautiful place. Um, so on behalf of Operation Pod and the city of Bowling Green, we'd like to present you with this award. So thank you all. Thank you all so much. It was a very fun project. The building was really old and needed a lot, needed a lot. <laughs> But uh, you mentioned the furniture on the countertop. That was all done in-house. Mm. Uh, my, my sons are coming up as woodworkers. And mm. so everything in there was done by us. It's incredible. And it even has like a seating area with bookshelves that go around and like lounge type of seating. It's a very comfortable environment. So, and they have the best chai tea in town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And cinnamon rolls. Yeah, and cinnamon rolls. Yes. I've heard. Awesome. Wow. <laughs> I've heard about that. Well, everything there is baked yeah, that right. day. Yeah. Nothing is... is shipped in, nothing is brought in fro, everything is baked fresh that morning. The bagels actually start 24 hours before because it's a 24 hour process to make them. And then they're all made and put out that morning. So you won't ever get anything that's not good. Congratulations, thank you for that's your wonderful. investment you. in the community. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, William, we appreciate it. Any other words of recognition? Anything? Do you have any comments tonight, sir? Do not. No. Thank you very much. First item is approval of minutes for our regular meeting on January 7th, 2020. Move. Second. Motion by Nash, second by Perigen. Any additions, deletions, or corrections? Please call the roll. Nash. Yes. Perigen. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Denning. Yes. Wilkerson. Yes. Municipal Order 2020, number six. Municipal order authorizing and accepting negotiations after sealed bidding for bid number 2020-21 for the Russell Sims Aquatic Center pump and filter replacement project from Spear Corporation of Roachdale, Indiana in the amount of $385,203. Second. By Nash, second by Beasley Brown, Mr. Mosley. It's hard to believe, but our aquatic center is uh, roughly 20 years old and we've been uh, doing well out there, but it's time uh, that our pump uh, need some attention. We've had some uh, issues over the last couple of years uh, that are concerning that we could have to shut down the whole place and which would cost us a lot of money that uh, a lot of revenue. So before you tonight, uh, this is a was a budget request in the FY20 budget to replace the pump system out there. Uh, we only had one bidder on the project spear. They came in originally at 434.905. Uh, Brent went to work and did some negotiation uh, with Spear, and we have them down to 385-203. Uh, that's with us doing a little bit of work in-house ourselves. 
Um, we do, we kind of wrestled with this one knowing that this was a costly expense, but at the same time, uh, we run the risk of, of losing uh, operations going down out there in the prime months of the summer, June, July, and August when, the, when everybody wants to go to the pool and would hate to have to shut the thing down for a month or whatever it would take to, to fix it and replace it. So uh, we, we wrestled with that, and uh, we believed now is the time to go ahead and do this. We've got money uh, budgeted, and we found a little bit extra in the parks development fund uh, to get this job done. We're afraid if we wait too much longer, the price will keep going up as well. Uh, Brent's here, uh, can answer any questions you might have on this project, but we're recommending to go ahead and proceed uh, with your, with your uh, approval with Spear Corporation for the 385 number. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Is this the first time we're replacing? Yeah. So when you think about that, 20 years. Uh, this, this one should last another 20, 15 or 20. You know, I think sometimes it, we have sticker shock when we talk about 385,000, but you divide that by 20 and you're talking about around nineteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year, which is a lot different to provide that kind of quality of life. Uh, so this is a new system. Pool. This would be replacing our current system. Yep. Comments? Double roll. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2020, number seven. Municipal Order approving the continuation of agreements for local and out of town card fuel service with Valor LLC and bulk fuel supply service with Key Oil Company. Gentlemen. Motion by Denning, second by Perigen. Ms. Marvel? About four years ago, we uh, decided to go uh, do a consortium uh, on our fuel with WKU and VGMU uh, with uh, Key Oil Company, or Valor LLC. Uh, we did some, uh, in that contract, we had some options to renew for two-year terms. Uh, we have uh, studied this again, and this would be our third two-year term. Uh, that we are renewing. Uh, we feel like the price is right, and uh, WKU and VGMU are still on board to continue with this partnership and are recommending a two-year extension of this contract for our fuel for all of city vehicles and equipment uh, with, with the key oil company. I'm and I think question. Greg, is Greg here? Greg's not here, sorry. I'll, I can try to answer questions if you have any. Comments or questions? I had one question. Uh, Mr. Michael, I didn't notice that, that there was a price uh, that we did have a contract on in our memo, but I didn't know if that's because it was a sealed sort of um, I, I fitting. I try it's, and answer that. It's it, a hope. This is a um, cost plus, so we don't have any set dollar figure um, on the contract other than um, whatever the can't remember the exact terminology. The rack rate. Thank you. Um, I don't know what that means exactly, but there is a rack rate for fuel, and then we pay that I think plus a little bit. And it's no more than ten percent, I believe, above. Um, but so there's not an actual dollar it's associated. It's with a all below that. retail yeah. price figure, though, that it we is. pay. It floats with the price of fuel. And we spend somewhere around. Five hundred thousand dollars on fuel for police vehicles and all the other fleet equipment that we have. Yep. Call the roll. Nash. Yes. Perigen. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Dinning. Yes. Wilkerson. Yes. Municipal Order Twenty Twenty Number Eight. Municipal order authorizing the acceptance of 2020 grant funds from the Appalachia High Intensity Gr Drug Tra Trafficking Area through the Office of National Drug Control Policy in the amount of $36,000. So moved. Urgent second by Nash, Mr. Marvel. We have received the HIDA grant for a number of years and we have been uh, notified that we are uh, have the 2020 allotment again for $36,000. Uh, this grant uh, provides for overtime for our two officers that we provide to the Warren County Drug Task Force. There is no match to this $36,000, which is even better. Uh, and uh, again, it's used for overtime, approximately up to 900 hours of overtime enforcement uh, with our 
Warren County Drug Task Force, in which we provide two officers to. Uh, Nick Cook is here. He, I'm sure, worked on this grant. If you have any questions, comments or questions, Laurel? Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes, Municipal Order 2020, number nine. Municipal order authorizing the submission of a grant to the United States Tennis Association Southern 2020 Grant Program to host a regional wheelchair event in an amount up to $1,500. Second. By Nash, second by Perrigan, Mr. Mike. This one is uh, pretty self-explanatory too. It's a really exciting program. Uh, we are applying for a uh, $1,500 grant to do a special pops tennis tournament here in Bowling Green, uh, sponsored by the USTA, the Southern section. Uh, no match is required on this one either. We could get $1,500 to provide t-shirts, uh, awards, uh, even tournament officials, refreshments, that sort of thing. Uh, Brent and Nick, Brent Belcher and Nick Cook worked on this, and they're here if you have any questions, but uh, this is the fir would be a first time on this event uh, for our Special Populations Division. We wish to submit this application with your approval. Comments or questions? Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2020, number 10. Municipal Order authorizing and approving revisions to the Housing Choice Voucher Program Annual Plan and Administrative Plan. So moved. By Beasley Brown, second by Nash. Mr. Nigel. This is related to the 30 new uh, mainstream vouchers that we recently we found that we were getting uh, with that requires some amendments to our uh, PHA. And so uh, before you tonight are those changes amendments uh, marked in red. And I'm going to ask uh, Brent Childers to step up uh, and answer any of your questions, maybe give you a brief overview of what these changes entail. Brent. <coughs> Good evening, Mr. Chair. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Nozzle. Uh, so it actually has two plans. There's an annual plan, which is a very simple couple-page document where we just list in there uh, that we are pushing these vouchers out to the community. And then the other one is the administrative plan, which you have two pages of 200 and something pages of a much larger document. So what, uh, whenever we have had this plan in the past, or the administrative plan, we didn't have these types of vouchers, so we didn't have to have policies related to how we will implement those. So now we've now that we've received these, we're introducing new policies related to implementation of those. Uh, so this is administrative because of the funding that we've received. Uh, we need to do this so we can start rolling those out, uh, looking for a March 1 start date. So I'll entertain any questions anybody might have. In the amendment, huh? in this amendment, <coughs> is there any increase uh, in the number of vouchers? So we had 616. Um, once we received the 30, that would take us to 646. We're making these changes so that we can incorporate those 30 as part of our program to increase us to 646 vouchers. We were awarded 30, I think, November, December, uh, but now we have to make the administrative changes to function those as part of our system. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of ordinance BG 2020, number one. Ordinance rezoning real estate. Ordinance rezoning a portion of attractive land containing 83.41 acres from agriculture and GB general business to RS1B single family residential, RM4 multifamily residential, HB highway business and LI light industrial, located at 6309 Russellville Road, presently owned by Frank T. Wheeler Estate, care of Vicki W. Harris, with Mursad Alik as the applicant. So moved. Second. Uh, Perigen, <laughs> second by Nash. Uh, this is first reading of a nearly unanimous recommendation from Planning and Zoning. If you have any questions regarding that, the attorney is here tonight. If there's any comments or questions. I had a comment. Uh, I just wanted to commend the Planning Commission and Mr. Davenport and the owners watching back that video and how the Planning Commission uh, listened to the neighborhood at first denied it and then you all worked with the neighborhood listening figuring out okay what considerations do we need to come together and look at to provide um, a quality of life for the new development coming in but also the existing neighborhood uh, looking back at how you all handled that I think that's the way um, I would love
love for all of our planning and zoning commission meetings to be handled. I just so I just wanted to let you all know how uh, grateful I was for the time that you all took and the listening that you all did to the neighborhood and the planning commission for uh, facilitating that. I thought it was really well done, and so just grateful for how you all went about that in being. Um, collaborative and um, considering all the factors at play so just thank you I'm gonna add a little bit to that because I agree um, that was a model of, of how things ought to work and I had somebody actually from that neighborhood that that said you know to somebody went to school with my husband that said we thought just because somebody came in and said this is what they want to do with this land it was a done deal and so I want the community to understand that it's never a done deal. It's not a done deal. When the yellow signs go up, that is when you need to have your voice heard. So in talking with this person that's a little bit older than me, that's been through life, that um, they, they believe it's a done deal when the signs go up, that's your invitation to get involved. And, and so at the end of this whole thing and the conversation was, we felt empowered, we felt like our voices were important, we felt like what what we needed for our community they weren't interested in stopping development they were interested in in making it work for everybody so i guess to the community that is watching this that can understand that it's not a done deal we don't pre-plan all these things that that's just not the way this works planning and zoning is here it's planning and so we want the community to be a part of the planning and your neighborhood is important so watch for those signs and get involved when the signs go up. Thank you. One time Melinda brought a sign, and I wish I had one here today. If I might just say thank you for those comments on behalf of my clients. Sure. They did work very hard with those neighbors to try to tweak what was done the first time and present a plan that was more, much more acceptable to the neighbors. So I do appreciate you recognizing that. Thank you very much. Mr. Davenport, I think it's also important to recognize you, though, in that process as well. And I know you're deferring to your clients, but y your clients take direction from you or take advice from you, and you participated in that. And, you know, sometimes you and I have sparred up here, uh, but I, I want to make sure I'm on record as, as saying that in, in addition to the others that have spoken and the vote that will be, I appreciate you, I you giving good guidance in that area. Appreciate that's very kind. Um, I do appreciate that, but I will I, not to be redundant. I do take uh, my, and I appreciate your comments, I do try to help my clients, but ultimately it's the owners of land and it's the developers I represent in this case that we're willing to make those concessions. So th I appreciate that very much. I agree. On the roll. Nash. Yes. Perigen. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Dinning. Yes. Wilkerson. Yes. Municipal Order 2020, number 11. Municipal order approving an interlocal cooperation agreement and declaration of trust with the Kentucky League of Cities to participate in the Kentucky League of Cities Investment Pool Plus program. So moved. Motion by Perigen, second by Nash. Ms. Mosley. I believe at the last meeting we uh, discussed the uh, option uh, that the General Assembly has given us for a variety of investment options that we will have going into the future. Uh, with that, uh, KLC has also put together a, an investment pool. Uh, we have been looking at that finance. Katie has been looking at it, and it's 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 sponsored. It's not sponsored, but it's run by managed by PNC Bank. Uh, if we are to enter into that investment pool, uh, there is a requirement for an interlocal cooperation agreement. I'm going to let uh, Katie take it from here, but I may have stole her thunder, but. Uh, Katie's been working with KLC, talking to them, and working on this agreement. And I'll let Katie take it from here and answer any questions you may have. In your packet, you have quite a bit of documentation um, that talks all about the investment pool, the bylaws, um, how it's all set up, how it works. Uh, but in order for any local government to participate, we have to sign on to their interlocal um, so we just need approval by the board to do that. This isn't something that we would use uh, immediately. Um, we're going to look at it, so this would be another investment tool available. Uh, right now we don't have any funds available to invest. We have to wait for some maturities to happen before we could move anything there. But we can go ahead and set up the account and get all of the preliminary work done ahead of time because there's no cost to set up the account. Um, but the way the KLC program is working, 
it it helps pull together particularly for smaller communities larger resources so they can make a better return on their investment where they may not have had that opportunity if they're just taking a small dollar on their own and versus pooling it together so this again is just another tool for us to be able to use in the future Nash Harrigan Beasley Brown Denning Wilkerson this municipal order 2020 number 12 Municipal order approving conveyance of the city's interest in 1141 State Street to Warren County and authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute the deed and all other necessary documents. So moved. Second. Urgen, second by Nash. Mr. Miser. This one's uh, somewhat self-explanatory as well. Uh, we have been on the deed with the county on 1141 State <laughs> Street. This is the old uh, um, Ben's old office, planning and zoning. Uh, contractors licensing board is all still in there but uh, we jointly own this building for I don't know how many years now but uh, it's it's time to let it go uh, we we've, we've had no we've had no in really cost or benefit in being on the deed the county is willing to take it over uh, and so we are proposing to uh, deed this over to the county 1141 State Street did I misstate something there any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Ash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2020 13. Municipal Order approving conveyance of the city's interest in 401 Kentucky Street to the Warren County Downtown Economic Development Authority, Incorporated, and authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute the deed and all other necessary documents. So moved. Second. Motion by Nash. Second by Denning. Um, this one is a similar issue. We, we've been a joint owner of the depot uh, for some time now, probably since 2000, around 2000 maybe. Uh, after the de depot development authority was dissolved, uh, the city and county took joint ownership in the, in the depot. Mostly after all the renovations that had been made, we did borrow uh, about a million dollars for grant m match money around 2005 that has been uh, paid off matured as of this past June so the building uh, is debt free uh, the city has been work city and county has been working with friends of Ellen in now for a couple years uh, trying to move in the direction of them taking ownership of the building uh, we have recently found out that that's just not going to be a feasible uh, plan for the friends of Ellen in so uh, City and county uh, have, have found another alternative. This this depart this um, this property is actually located within the TIF district, right there next to the depot. And there has been some interest in that vacant lot property next to the depot. And so, what we are proposing to do is allow uh, the Warren County Downtown Economic Development Authority to take over ownership of this building this property the whole property and market it to uh, a new developer to develop something on that property that which it, which is within the TIF district and so before you tonight uh, the county's already acted uh, for for their half of the deed they have voted and moved on it Friday at their fiscal court meeting uh, tonight we are proposing or having before you uh, the city would deed our half over to the Warren County Downtown Economic Development Authority for marketing and development of that property uh, as well as to preserve the depot in, in, in its uh, existing state with the museum there. Friends of Ellen Inn would continue their operations there as well and the city and county would no longer uh, kind of be in the mix of ownership of that building. So we are deeding it over the DD, uh, to the, the authority and then letting the authority uh, market it uh, for the TIF district to, to, to um, make it what it could be, which it's, it's got a lot of potential. And uh, there's projects that could partner very well with the depot, uh, but that's going to be all up to the Warren County uh, Economic Development Authority, of which myself and Commissioner Perrigan are members of that board. So we're meeting, I think, on Thursday to further discuss this project. But tonight, before you is the transfer of the deed over to Warren County Downtown Economic Development Authority. 
comments or questions? Overall? Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. All the voting items we have on our session tonight, but we have a work session on presentation of the 2019 Gateways for Growth Challenge Strategic Plan, Building Community and Growing Our Economy, a Welcoming Plan for New Americans. And who's going to take the lead in that? I guess that's Miss Leda. All right. That was it? That was your agenda? Woohoo! All right. Good evening. Do you take a break? No. Keep going. Wait a second. I'm Leda Becker, International Communities Liaison with the City of Bowling Green. You guys know me. Um, and I have the pleasure of um, this evening greeting you, Mayor, Board of Commissioners. Um, yes, so you have a copy of the plan. This uh, during a luncheon at noon, we publicly unveiled the finished product of what is called Building Community and Growing Our Economy, a welcoming plan for new Americans. And today we have with us some special guests um, who we have invited to present uh, the recommendations put forth in this plan. So I'd like to introduce to you guys our national partner, one of our national partners, New American Economy. We have Kate Brick with us today and Mo Kantner. Uh, Kate Brick is a director of local and state initiatives for New American Economy, who was part of our funding source for the Gateways for Growth Challenge. So I'd like to invite her up to the podium so that she can address you. Welcome. Good evening, commissioners. Um, my name is Kate Brick. As Leda said, I'm with New American Economy. We are an organization based in New York. I know a few of you were at the event this morning, so I don't want to um, go into too much detail, but for those of you who weren't, just a little bit of background. We were started about 10 years ago by a bipartisan coalition of more than 500 business leaders and mayors from all across the country who came together because they wanted to talk about immigration in a different way. Um, and the way that we are talking about it is through this economic lens. And so a huge part of the work that we do at our organization is produce original research that quantifies how immigrants and refugees are an economic driver um, across every community in the country, across industries. And we've been doing this work nationally for 10 years, but in the last several years, we've been starting to focus a lot more at the state and local level, recognizing that it's in communities like Bowling Green where you've seen your population change very quickly. And that's been very much tied to economic growth, but there's a lot of challenges as well as opportunities that come um, with such rapid growth. And so our organization partnered with another national group called Welcoming America a few years ago to create the Gateways for Growth Award. And this is a competitive opportunity for communities to actually submit an application to receive a few different types of resources from NAE, um, first of which is research. And so Bowling Green was selected um, in the second round of this award to get a research brief that looked at the economic contributions that immigrants and refugees make to Warren County. Um, hopefully you've seen this before, um, but this really kind of gave a landscape that for the first time we were able to understand in dollars and cents who immigrants are and what their role is in the local economy. We found that they were responsible for more, more than a third of population growth in the five year period that we looked at, that they played an outsized role in the labor force, they were contributing millions of dollars in taxes and in GDP. And so after we gave this report to the city, um, and I should say the reason that the city was picked um, among this very competitive landscape um, in that second round was because there was this very impressive multi-sector leadership and commitment. And so we had the city, we had the Chamber of Commerce, we had civil society leaders who came together to make the case for why Bowling Green was really ready to, to take on um, this kind of project. And so after we gave the research a year later under the leadership of Leda and Brent and many others who were in the room, um, the city applied for the second phase of the award, which was technical assistance to go through a planning process and a match grant. And so in this round, the third round of the award, Bowling Green was one of only six communities nationally that received this technical assistance and this matching grant. And I, I really want to emphasize to you how important that local match was. Um, we've done this work now in 50 different communities around the country. And I can tell you that the cities that 
got the technical assistance and didn't have that local investment weren't as successful. It was a lot harder to go through the process that you all just completed, the six-month planning process that included community conversations and outreach and input from a diverse group of stakeholders, and it, it takes a lot of time and work and, and help. And so the matching grant that came from the city helped to contract um, Steve and Brian, who you're gonna hear from, from Cincinnati, who are experts and were able to help facilitate this process. Um, and so today we're really excited to endorse the plan um, and all the work that this team has done and to say that we're going to continue to be a resource. And I just would want to emphasize too that the work really starts now. And so the investment that came from the city led us to this point, but I would encourage you all to think about now that we have this set of 22 recommendations that you're going to hear about, all the different ways that the city can make sure it's inclusive and accessible and that every single resident has a pathway to success is gonna require continued investment and commitment. Um, and for our part, we'll be there to help in New York, but I think you have an amazing team here locally that's doing this work, and we're excited to support it. Thanks so much. Next up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the commission. My name is Steve Driehaus, I'm here with my colleague Brian Wright. We are from Cincinnati Compass, and we are what your money was spent on. You, you're what you identified as the expert, right? That's right. Oh, I, nice. that, that, that just means we live more than 100 miles away. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it always works with experts. No, but we, we did a similar process in Cincinnati, and uh, we are well into the implementation of the plan in Cincinnati that the mayor initiated uh, with about 60 community partners. And so we've been spending uh, the last six months here meeting with community partners um, and met with over 100 people to talk about how we could create a more welcoming environment for new Americans in, in Bowling Green. And I can tell you it's been, it's been a wonderful process. Uh, do you all have a copy of this? Um, so rather than walk you through the whole process and what we went through, you can read about that uh, in the plan. I would like you to turn, if you will, to page 14 because what I really want to focus on are the 22 recommendations. Uh, from all of those meetings, we had over 100 recommendations. We edited those, we consolidated those, and came up with the 22 that you see in front of you today. And we categorized those in, in three different ways. Uh, first, around strengthened and inclusive economies. Secondly, uh, connected and safe communities. And third, engaged and informed families. And I don't want to go through each of the recommendations again. Several of you have heard this presentation today already. Um, but I did want to point out that in the first section, we look at both how businesses can benefit from the hiring of new Americans here in Bowling Green and how businesses can benefit each other by sharing best practices relative to hiring new Americans. But then also we look at workforce and workforce development and how we can take the talent that we're receiving here in Bowling Green and plug them into economic development and, and, and encourage them to be entrepreneurs, but also to take their talents and plug them into the gaps that we have uh, in our workforce currently in Bowling Green. The, the two other components here are about creating a, a more welcoming community. We, we look at parks, we look at housing, we look at a variety of things, and then finally, uh, families and helping families be successful once they arrive here in Bowling Green. So with that, given that you have uh, the report in front of you, uh, we're all here to answer any questions you might have. But thank you for the opportunity. We, we very much appreciate it, and it's really been a wonderful six months. I, I got something to add, Steve, if you don't mind. Appreciate the presentation today, and <clears throat> it was great. And, and, but I think there was one, one thing that was really important to me that I learned at the presentation that I think everybody might want to hear is how you define new Americans. New Americans is anybody that wasn't born here in the United States. So that might be a refugee. And refugees uh, are here. Many people don't often distinguish between refugees and other immigrants. Uh, refugees are actually uh, escaping political persecution or religious persecution. They're here under a program that's sponsored by the United States government in contract with the International Center here. And so those are refugees. So we often talk about refugees coming to Bowling Green but also other individuals. So you have a lot of secondary migration. 
that occurs here in Bowling Green. So by secondary migration, we mean you know people might originally go to Atlanta or New York or Chicago, but because they have a relative in Bowling Green or they have friends in Bowling Green, they've heard about it, they then move to Bowling Green. And so you have a significant secondary migration here in Bowling Green, and that's why we've seen such tremendous growth in the immigrant population here uh, in the city and also in the county. Thank you. I just didn't want anybody to think that they actually had citizenship to be a new American. That's, that's not the case. They're the oh, this, this is people often working towards citizenship, right. uh, but also people here on refugee status, people here on green card status. So they're, all of the different statuses are covered here. Yeah, and they're trying to get everybody involved <laughs> in the community. Right. Thank you. Would you mind walking through the uh, recommendations that um, involve the city? So I know you had some related to parks and rec and the police department as well as maybe some housing. So I just want to get an understanding of which of these recommendations that the city needs to be um, looking at in terms of uh, making sure we're, we're doing our part. Sure. Uh, most of those in strengthen and inclusive economies um, involve the Chamber of Commerce, involve the business community. I, I think there might be some city support there, but I don't think we see the city as leading on, on those necessarily. As you look into um, the other recommendations when we look at connected and safe communities, uh, connecting new Americans to Which community. Which page is that on? I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, on page 18. Okay. When you look at areas where there may be a role to play, um, connecting new Americans to community resources. The city's already doing a pretty good job of helping uh, the immigrant community better understand the resources available to them. We recommend so other, several other community partners who might also be engaged in that. Um, number three is exploring the potential for creating a BGID. Uh, this is a municipal ID and it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, sponsored by the city itself. In Cincinnati, the faith-based community issues these IDs. The idea being that oftentimes people don't have the necessarily necessary identification, and this isn't just with uh, the immigrant population, but you can think also about the homeless population. And this is really a benefit to um, the police because oftentimes when, when they interact uh, with somebody that doesn't have identification, they have to bend over backward to figure out who this individual is. It can take quite a bit of time. It can take a lot of process. They'll often have to detain people if they don't have the proper identification. Um, and this becomes an issue for law enforcement. We found in Cincinnati and, uh, and communities across the country have now adopted this. Um, we weren't the first. That, that it helps just in terms of having an ID that they sh can show to the police. They can show, and, and it might be recognized at the city recreation center, you know, whatever it might be but uh, an ID that just identifies who they are. It's important that the entity that's issuing these IDs does the due diligence, you know, looking at, you know, all of their documentation. And, and the problem oftentimes with, with people, with new Americans uh, coming to us is that their documentation is incomplete. So they may not have a birth certificate. Um, they, off, they have a passport usually, um, but they have different, they have varying documents. And so, you need to have an organization, an entity that you can trust who will verify their identification in order to issue the ID. In some cases, that's the municipality itself. In other cases, it's someone else. So the International Center, for example, may be a very good place to look to issue these IDs since they've, they've issued some type of form of ID in the past. And so the International Center was also recognized in that category. Um, the other areas where we're looking at the city of Bowling Green, exploring options for providing transportation connections for new Americans to employment opportunities. Uh, we've heard this in, in nearly every one of our roundtable discussions when, when we talked to new Americans. The challenge of transportation is a very real one. Um, many of us just take for granted that we get in our car and we go to work. Um, that's not the case for new Americans often because they're not at the income level or they don't have a driver's license, so they can't necessarily do that. Having available, affordable public transport is very, very important. And we also heard this from the business community, that we need to make transport available uh, to get people to their job sites. And I know Brent's working on this. I know uh, the commission's going to work on this with the mayor. Uh, I think you, also, you all know that public transport is a need here in Bowling Green. 
and you struggle with it as we struggle with it in Cincinnati and many, many communities across the country struggle with it. But it is a key component to getting people to the work, workplace. Um, if you look at number six, creating affordable and safe housing options for new Americans. Uh, we think this is very, very important uh, because if, if people are moving uh, to Bowling Green, you certainly, uh, one of the ways to make them welcome is to have safe, affordable housing. Um, now, I, I recognize in the state of Kentucky, it's a little different than the state of Ohio in terms of the, the power that local governments have in, in creating um, housing codes and things of that nature. But what I discussed earlier today with the mayor and, and could be a possibility and is included in the recommendations is something like a, a, a model uh, tenant agreement, uh, a model lease. Because oftentimes what happens is new Americans will move to a location they're not aware of the culture, they're not aware of the rules and regulations, and they're often taken advantage of by landlords. And so there will be a contract that they sign, they're not necessarily familiar with what should be included in a lease, and so they often find themselves entering into contracts that you know, are certainly not to their benefit. So the, the commission could consider uh, uh, an idea of what is a model lease, what should be included in a lease. You're not necessarily telling everyone this is what has to be included, but you're setting the standard and saying this is, this is what we believe should be included in a lease. You could consider doing the same thing around lease options. We had quite a few families when we were talking to them um, discuss these lease option contracts. This is a challenge for communities across the country. Uh, lease options can be a very good vehicle to owning a home, but oftentimes they're not because there are so many caveats in the contract that if you're in violation of one, you lose everything that you put into it. And so that's another area where the city could certainly look at model lease options and what's appropriate and work with the community and work with landlords uh, th to get it right when it comes to welcoming immigrants. Um, enhancing uh, parks and recreation is, is certainly an area that we can look at. Uh, I talked with the city manager this morning about the possibility of that and, and I think Looking at parks and recreation is very, very important if we're going to be welcoming. We want to make sure that new Americans are welcomed in all of our you know, institutions here in the city. But we also talked about, it was interesting, when we were talking to some of the families, they, they talked about you know, having a recreational league in soccer, for example, where you know, we welcome some of the immigrants into the league. Or even sports that we don't currently play in Bowling Green that may be played elsewhere, but allowing the facilities to be used for those sports. You could also use that as a vehicle uh, to help people better understand other cultures. Because a big part of this is about uh, understanding other cultures and how that plays cross-culturally. And so uh, parks and recreation are certainly an opportunity. Um, as I look through the rest of these, uh, promoting and enhan enhancing civic engagement is obviously one that's uh, a possibility. Uh, we could consider how to better involve uh, new Americans in city government, for example, uh, or in the administration. Uh, certainly, that's very helpful in the police force. When we had our meetings with law enforcement, um, it was very, very helpful to have a conversation uh, around possibly bringing immigrants in, and I believe they did hire a new American recently, um, to, to help create better relationships between law enforcement and, and the immigrant community. I think that's critically important. And so wherever someone from a different culture can see someone that they know, you know, someone that looks like them, on the other side of the desk, you know, we're going to break down those barriers. And so the city can take a look at where that might happen and, and how we might break down those barriers for new Americans. Um, I think that's just about it. I think I've highlighted most of them. Would you mind going back to page 20, number seven, because there are quite a few mentioned there with fire and uh, our police department that I saw what we're under expanding cultural competency. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, expanding cultural competency, and, and there are opportunities here through the I speak cards, for example, and some of the other things that we identified. It's really about helping all of us better understand how we can be more welcoming. So the city has a role to play, businesses have a role to play, uh, churches have a role to play, the entire community has a role to play uh, under expanding community cultural competency but the city can also look at that area. And the city's doing a pretty good job on, on its end. You know, through, through Leda's work and, and Brent's work, you're doing a great job 
of reaching out. But there's always more that can be done. There's always more communication that can be done in terms of creating an environment uh, in the community that's more welcoming. Thank you. I just have a follow-up question maybe for Brent in terms of, um, I guess, the what is the formal structure of implementation or deciding how to prioritize the implementation of some of these recommendations? Yeah, so as I talked about today, uh, this is not a city plan. This is the city commission this on behalf of the entire community. Uh, we see this as a community resource, a community tool. Uh, that This is something that we spearheaded, but we're also the kind of industry leaders of this here locally. Um, so the, the actual plan itself will be housed by the community partner community. Help me out again, Adam. Partner. I got the partnership wrong. Community Partnership for Immigrant and Refugee Families. Thank you, Lana. Uh, who is, is a group of service providers that are committed to doing this type of work. Now, the city will play a role in a portion of these, just as Mr. Driehaus talked about in some of the things that are clearly city functions. And many of these things are things that we're already doing. So you talk about the cultural competency. All of our full-time employees and many of our seasonal part-time employees receive four hours of cultural competency training. But as we talk to other organizations and other agencies, they're not making that type of commitment to their staff. So the community as a whole still needs to do a better job of that. The city has been doing that for a number of years and Leda has done trainings after trainings after trainings after trainings uh, for city staff because the city made that investment for its employees. Uh, so we'll continue to look at what are some of those. I talked this afternoon about Parks and Rec. Obviously that's, a, that's one for us and I think our Parks Department has done a great job uh, of looking at it, but there's always, like Steve said, there's always more things. Uh, today, we took uh, Kate and Mo out for a tour around Bowling Green, kind of let them see some of the neighborhoods and things, and got to introduce them to futsal. Uh, you know, the city's putting in, in a futsal court. If you'd asked me 10 years ago, where's the city gonna build a first futsal court? I said, what are you talking about? Uh, but that's a way that I think that the, our Parks and Rec Department has listened to what does the community desire. We had a bunch of old volleyball courts that were really being underutilized and had kind of fallen in, and now we've said we could take that space and make it a better community resource. Those are the types of things that the city will continue to do moving forward. To say that one priority is greater than the other, uh, I, I think would be a misstatement. I think it's sometimes about timing and opportunity. There are some of these things that would take much more time to develop and foster and grow. Some of these things are a little bit more easily achievable. That doesn't mean that one has higher priority than the other, it's just, things evolve as they go, uh, and the community will continue to change and evolve as we go. We always have to be aware of that. This is really the first time that this community has had a document of this type. Uh, you think about latest position being in existence for only eight years. That was the first time that uh, an, an institution in this county had said, we're gonna make a commitment to focus on this population. And now eight years later, okay, now we're gonna make this investment for a plan to how do we best uh, create this community moving forward. These are all new territories. Whenever we started this process, I think it was Brian that dropped a line on me uh, that I've remembered uh, since then. We're all trying to figure out how, the, how to fly the plane while we're in the air. Uh, there's not a lot of history uh, that goes along with this. So a lot of the things we're trying to kind of boil down to simplicity and try to really focus in on what's really the best thing for the community and how do we move this forward. Uh, the overall goal of this is create uh, workforce and economic development opportunities to continue to make Bowling Green a successful place to call home as it has been for the last, uh, my entire lifetime, which is going on 40 years now. Slim, did you have a question? Okay, my apologies. Um, yeah, 39, 40 answers. in November, so. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> well, thank uh, all of you, especially Brent and Leda, uh, for all of your leadership, and like you said, um, for being uh, such a leader in our community over the last decade of how do you um, welcome our immigrant and refugee, our new Americans, and uh, provide a cultural competency training. I've been really impressed as I have uh, been trained by you, Leda, as a city commissioner in cultural competency and seen how you all have uh, made sure that all of our departments are being welcoming to all of our uh, community residents. So thank you all. And I have one question. Thank you for coming back to the podium. When you talked about that uh, the city is training for cult cultural competency, but a lot of times we don't see private businesses doing that, is that a, is that a way that the city could participate in that? Uh, or is there a way in, in inviting, and maybe we're already doing so, but inviting private businesses to send employees 
it's a conversation to have. We have partnered in very limited capacity uh, just because we understand that we have one trainer. We made this investment uh, as a city, as an organization, to invest in our employees to provide the best service possible. Uh, and we also recognize that that investment uh, comes with return, and that return is that continual training of employees. Uh, so in, in, some, in some instances, it's almost like there others need to make those same types of investments for their employees. Now, if you're talking about a, a five-person business, no, that's not the same thing. But if you're talking about a 500, 600 uh, place, those conversations have come up more and more, and I've always been hesitant to engage the city in that type of uh, contracting for uh, services, uh, but would be glad to turn them in on to other services that could be provided. One thing that we did learn whenever we hosted, uh, the chamber hosted one of the meetings that they talked about, we had about 14 different employers surrounding the table up in the big uh, boardroom, and that question came up, and then they started sharing back and forth across, well, here's what we did, here's some of the trainings that we did. So those things are going on out there in the marketplace. I don't know that the city has to be the provider of that in our role as government, uh, but I think it's important for us to encourage people to say, well, have you ever trained your employees on how to use language line or an over-the-phone interpreter? Well, no. Have you ever you know, trained your employees on cultural competency? Well, no. Well, those are things to think about it, as us being a leader in this uh, for this community. I guess that's more of what I was thinking. As opposed to sending our trainer to a plan of a couple hundred people, I was talking about encouraging businesses to send one person so they can experience what, you know, what cultural competency actually means. Yeah. I mean, it, it's amazing to me how many people don't fully under, you know, they hear the word. They think it means something else. Yes. So yeah, with cultural competency, we do have a license to teach a spe specific curriculum from the cross-cultural health care program in Seattle. So I did a TOT there, and so I am a licensed trainer. And within our license agreement, we can only uh, train within our organization. So we're bound by that license agreement. We should not be utilizing that curriculum to train anyone outside. So there is an option of expanding that license to to uh, outside of our organization, and that's something that could we could potentially look at. Yeah, I, 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 I was looking not to train everyone, right. but to get people to get their feet wet, and then if they see the value of it, then they would advocate more strongly for it within their private sector position. Yeah, I saw Sky CTC there today, and, mm -hmm. and several other workforce training, the workforce board, and whatnot that have you know, a lot of resources out there that train on cultural competency. Western Kentucky University's Training and Development Center also does. So there's there's quite a few people that are capable of doing this, whether or not an organization wants to hire a trainer to come in and do the work. A um, little skin in the game I, I never hurts. I will say that we have the best. Yes, yes you do. Uh, so <laughs> that's that's there's I'm no doubt about say that. that. We have the best one. There's so. no doubt about that. We would have to clone, we would have to clone later, and that's, yeah, <laughs> that's, 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 that's but illegal. I do, Possible. yeah, I do think it would be worth looking into what would it look like for Leda to get a licensure to be a train of the trainers so that we could clone her. <coughs> and so that people are using sort of what we know is sort of best practices of cultural competency. Well, Going back to what Commissioner Perrigan was sit, sit, saying, this this plan here is a major, major um, piece of our workforce development solution. This is a major pipeline that we can start tapping if we can develop this properly as a part of the solution for our workforce development shortage. As you know, we, we stay, hover around 6,000, 7,000 uh, open positions in our 10 county area at any given time maybe half of those are in Warren County I'm not sure but it's r roughly half and so this this would be a major victory if we can get this going get these people in these local opening p open positions in our local companies around Bowling Green Warren County and even the surrounding counties there's people right now traveling two hours or more for work and it's it's just absolutely ludicrous and out of state out of state and here we have all, all th thousands of job openings that they could they could jump right into and build build a career and build a, a life here a good life here in Bowling Green Warren County and support their families so this, this is a great opportunity yeah. thank you Brent and Leda for heading this up
Thank you to all of you for all your participation in helping getting this done. Any other comments? Our next scheduled meeting is February 4th, 2020, and I still want to talk about the census for every meeting as we come up. That's coming up April 1st this year, so thanks for tuning in.